good afternoon uh, we begin with our introductory se session on kalidasa today uh, the session is divided into two parts we will be discussing about the author and we will be discussing about the play abhijan shakuntalam or also known as the recognition of shakuntala is a play by kalidasa who was kalidasa 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 states status as the major poet and dramatist in classical sanskrit literature is unquestioned that is high praise please have your pen and paper along with you so that you are able to take down important notes the high praise this is high praise kalidasa's accomplishment is distinguished not only by the excellence of the individual's work but by the many many sided talent which the whole achievement displays he is a dramatist a writer of epic and a lyric poet of extraordinary scope in his hands the language attained a remarkable flexibility becoming an instrument capable of sounding many moods and nuances of feeling a language that is limpid and flowing musical uncluttered by the verbal virtuosities indulged in by many writers who followed him yet remaining a language loaded in very rift with the rich ores of the literary and mystical elusiveness of his cultural heritage by welding different elements to create new genres his importance as an innovator in the history of sanskrit literature is clearly established the brilliant medieval lyric poet jayadeva in praising kalidasa as kavi kula guru masters of poet conveys his recognition of his, of this aspect of the poets kalidasa's work have been read with deep appreciation widely com commented upon and lavishly praised it would be safe to assume that the poet enjoyed success fame and affluence during the lifetime we sense no hint of dissatisfaction in his works no sign of bitterness at not receiving due recognition yet we do not possess any information about him his life and the times in which that his life unfolded and fulfilled itself all we are left with are a few legends the poet has drawn a veil of silence around himself so complete that even his real name is unknown to posterity so according to dc majumdar uh, a journal that a uh, article excerpt from an article uh, that was published in the journal um, in the journal of royal asiatic society of great britain and ireland uh, titled the date of kalidasa bc majumdar for kalidasa date of kalidasa says that as we do not know a fixed date of kalidasa kalidasa does not appear to have been court poet of any raja at all he must have earned a good deal by writing his works and by being rewarded by the imperial guptas he seemed to have lived principally at ujjain where he composed his drama shakuntala he did not dedicate his drama to any raja but presented it for being enacted at the local festival of the god mahakala it may be during his last days the poet became very closely associated with the imperial guptas so according to bc majumdar kalidasa does not appear to be any court poet and his work sakuntala uh, was not dedicated to any raja instead it was presented uh, enacted at a local festival of the god mahakala now coming to chandra rajan's uh, idea of of uh, what time and place kalidasa should be situated in uh it is from kalidasa's date page number 307 to 313 from kalidasa the loom of time tradition holds that kalidasa was the court poet of vikramaditya who ruled at ujjain a king who was a great conqueror and a hero a munificent 
patron of arts, learned, wise, and accomplished. A king who embodied the ideal kingship in himself, who drove the invading Sakas out of Malwa, presumably, and established the Vikrama or Samvat era in 57 BC to commemorate his victory. Kalidasa's patron is identified by some scholars as King Vikramaditya, son of Mahindra Ditya, of the Pramara dynasty ruling at Ujjain in the first millennium BC. This dynasty belonged to the Malavas mentioned in history as one of the clans following a republican form of government. This would be at close of the first millennium BC and accord with the first century BC, date of 57 BC, for the poet and of his association with the Vikramaditya who defeated the Sakas. Another veiled reference in the epic Raghuvamsam is seen as evidence of a first century BC date for the poet. This dating places Kalidasa at the close of the first millennium BC. Devabhuti ascended the throne in 82 BC and was assassinated in 73 BC on the orders of his minister Vasudeva who proclaimed himself emperor establishing the Kanava dynasty. On one of the three dates put forward for Kalidasa places the poet in the 2nd century BC during the period of Sunga empire and makes him the court poet of Agnimitra Sunga, son of Pusyamitra Sunga, the emperor ruling at Patliputra, the ancient capital of the northern empires of India. So these are the three dates in which uh, has been closely associated with Kalidasa. This is the second point in the slide that we are discussing. This is uh, by Chandra Rajan. So the first is uh, Kalidasa uh, being placed around 50, 1st century BC date of 57 BC. The second date is 82 BC uh, is the first millennium BC, close to 1st millennium BC. And the third date is 2nd century BC during the period of Sunga Empire. Claims have been made that the feel and tone of Gupta art of the 4th and 5th century AD indicate that it was contemporaneous with the great poet and dramatist that is Kalidasa. A strong case can be equally made out that the flowering in stone of the art of the Sunga Satvahana period, 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD, reflects the flowering in the verbal arts of Kalidasa's poetry. Of the 16 great kingdoms mentioned in the epic Magadha with its capital at Rajgare, very close to the later capital of Patliputra Patna, emerged as the most powerful powerful around 600 BC. The 6th century BC is very important in ancient history, politically and culturally because it saw not only the rise of Magadha, Bihar as a power as well on its way to becoming an empire, but also the rise of Jainism and Buddhism founded by Mahavira and Gautama Buddha as rival religious and system of thought to Vedic Brahmanism. The empire under Chandragupta Maurya and his grandson Asoka the Great included almost all of India, ex excepting the deep south and extended into Afghanistan and up to Khotan. The capital of the northern empire was at Patliputra and later at Ujjaini. Chandragupta II is mentioned as having shifted his capital from Ujjaini to Ayodhya, which was more central. But there seem to have always been four capitals to facilitate the administration of a far-flung empire with princes of the royal blood in charge and Ujjaini had been the western capital from very early times. In the south, the Satvahana rulers who are believed to have originated in Maharashtra, some historians think that they belong to Andhra Desa and that they are the Andhras mentioned in the late Vedic text prior to 600 BC with their capital at Pratisatana near Aurangabad, gradually spread east, consolidating their power in the peninsula, accepting the traditional Chola country in the deep south. Their kingdom grew into an empire around 3rd century BC to 3rd century AD. The two, power, the two parts, as was inevitable, 
met and clashed along the river Narmada, and the encounter of the armies is referred to in Kalidasa's work. Coming to the third point, that is a note on text and translation from Kalidasa, The Loom of Time. Page number 13 to page number uh, 20. Kalidasa's work have unfortunately come down to us not in their original form, but in several recensions. Recensions are divergent versions of a text current in different regions of the country. The ancestry of the recensions is not clear, but it is evident that after his lifetime, Kalidasa's poems and plays became subject to alterations, the reasons for which are not clear. It is not uncommon for this to happen in the history of Sanskrit literature. Many factors would have contributed to the process of the one true text becoming diverse recensions. The manuscripts of the work, works, none of them contemporaneous with the author, belong to one or other of the recensions. Recensions, once again, means divergent versions of a text. They display a bewildering variety of readings the length of the text themselves as well as the number and order of the verses in them vary. Interpolations present a problem. Some of the variants are substan substan substantive enough to warrant a somewhat different reading of the text as in the case of Abhijan Shakuntala, Shakuntala for short. The text of Shakuntala has been handed down in four main recensions. What are these four main recensions? Eastern or Bengal, Southern, Kashmir, and Devanagari. Which of these comes closest to the play as Kalidasa wrote it and as it was staged during his lifetime is difficult to determine. To say the least, Dilip Kumar Kanjilal attempts, his, attempts this difficult task in his critical edition of the play, a reconstruction of the Shakuntala, Shakuntalam that was published in year 1980. The Devanagari recension of Shakuntala was by Raghava Bhatta's commentary as published by the Nirnaya Sagar Press Bombay in the year 1883. So what is the difference between the Devanagari and the Bengali recension? The three differences between the two recensions are found mainly in Act 1. We know that the uh, play is divided into seven acts and the main difference between the Devanagari and the Bengali recension are found between Act 1 and Act 3. They are particularly significant in the love episodes which the Devanagari treats in a rather perfunctory manner. The Devanagari text, the first difference is abrupt trans transition. The Devanagari text seems to make somewhat abrupt transition in some places, giving the impression of something missing at that point. For example, it does not contain the line at the an end of Act 1, where Anusuya, Anusuya, who is a friend of Shakuntala, asks Shakuntala to hurry up and come with her and Priyambada, as well as Shakuntala's response about the numbness in her thighs. A death touch which conveys the sudden physical impact and overpowering e emotion makes. In Act 2, the Devanagari text does not have stanza 8, which seems to, an, to be an appropriate response to Madhavya's wry comment preceding it. The conversation regarding the untimely blossoming of the Madhavi bush is also not included either. The Bengal text devotes more space to the development of love of Shakuntala and Dushyant in Act 3. It presents the courtship as well as the conflict in Shakuntala's mind in some detail. Stanza 40 at the end of Act 3 reveals something of the complexity of the king's character. The first three lines bring out one aspect, the pleasure-loving and philandering side to his nature, that is King Dushanta, and it articulates his Carpe Diem philosophy, sees the movement before it flies away beyond your reach. But it concludes on a different note when Dushanta says, my heart in the beloved's presence stands somewhat abashed. A man of the world assured and poised and a great king who had fallen in and out of love many times. Dushanta now stands dumbfounded before the innocence and purity 
that Shakuntala represents. This is Act 3, and Bengal text devotes more space to the development of the love of Shakuntala and Dushanta. The second difference between the Devanagari and the Bengal recension is fully and finely developed characters. The king in Bengal text is more fully drawn. This is the third point that we are discussing right now in the slide. The king in Bengal text is more fully drawn. He is a man of words as well as of deeds, more so than in Devanagari text. He loves as passionately as he fights furiously. And he is a man who is in love with love as much as he is in love with a girl. A man who talks about love and being in love in a highly self-conscious manner. And how beautifully he speaks about it all. By presenting Dushanta in the first half of the play as a passionate lover, courtly and gallant, too gallant for the liking of simple hermit girl who mistrusts such gallantry and as it turns out with good reason, Kalidasa draws a sharp contrast between this man, debonair, noble and even considerate at times and the cynical, harsh and cold king of Act 5. Shakuntala is also drawn more finely in the Bengal text. The final section of Act 3 already referred to reveals another side to her character. She is not wholly innocent of the ways of love. Seeing through the king's film, flimsy stratagems to get close to her, she indicates that she too can play at this game, though not with his expertise. The Shakuntala of the Bengal text also shows some of the fiery spirit of her ancestors in the epic. Both the hero and the heroine are more idealized in the Devanagari text. They are more interesting in the Bengal recension. The minor characters come across better in the Bengal text. Priyamvada has more lines given to her, providing more scope for her bubbling sense of fun and her readiness to tease both Shakuntala and the king. Madhya's sharp wit, always reaching out to deflate Dushanta's ego and undercut his whole, his high-flown statement has more room to play around in the Bengali text. The third and the final difference between the Bengali and the Devanagari recension is the caption. The captions at the end of each act seem to be a feature of the Bengal recension. They are not found in the Devanagari text of the play, though the epic Raghu Vamsam and the long poet Kumara Sambhavam have captions at the end of each canto. In Sakuntala, the captions for the first two acts, the chase and the concealment of telling are notable. They contain an element of symbolism. The chase is a central motif in act one. The king is not merely chasing a deer, he is after a girl. The deer is closely associated with Shakuntala through imagery and it leads the king into her world, which has been characterized in the introduction as the green world as opposed to the gilded world of the court. The chase moti motif is picked up in Act 2, where we come across several phrases pertaining to the sport of hunting, the hunter's skill, his elation when he gets the quarry, knowledge of the changing responses of fear and anger of woodland creatures. Shakuntala reminds the king in Act 5 that during his day in the hermitage, he once described her and her pet fawn as kin, both creatures of the woods. All these phrases conveying as do the sense of dominance over the prey and gaining possess possession of it characterize the initial attitude of and relationship of Dushanta and Shakuntala. The interesting point to note about the caption to Act 2, the concealment of telling, is that it is paralleled by another concealment in Act 4, the con concealment of Durvasa's curse by Shakuntala's friend. The first concealment in Act 2 moves the plot forward. The second introduces the complication. The theme of concealment has ramification in the play. So the theme of concealment is one of uh, the important the theme of the play. Uh, Kalidasa's poetry, like much of Indian art, is stylized. The stylization is not rhetorical procedure, but part of the self-awareness with which the verses shape itself. Nature has a life of its own in Indian thought. It enshrines centers of power radiating holiness, plentitude, beauty. 
for this reason the flora in the kalidasan landscape um, is multitudinous there are several kinds of lotuses mentioned each with its own distinctive name in the original and each beautifully evocative because kalidasa's work emerges out of a philosophical context and returns us to it some information about religious and metaphysical concepts both vedic and shaiva is unavoidable so coming to the vedic and the shaiva school of thought that is point uh, 3.2 in the slide the concept coming to uh, the point 3.2 sacrifice cosmogony and astrology uh by surendranath das gupta uh, page number 21 to 26 the conception of brahman which has been the highest glory for the vedanta philosophy of later days had hardly emerged in the rigveda from the association of the sacrificial mind the meanings that sayana the celebrated commenter of the vedas gives of the word as collected by hog are food food offering the chant of the sama singer magical formula or text duly completed ceremonies the chant and sacrificial gift together the recit recitation of the holy priest great roth says that it also means the devotion which manifests itself as longing and satisfaction of the soul and reaches forth to the gods but it is only in the satpata brahmana that the conception of brahman has acquired a great significance as the supreme principle which is the moving force behind the god thus the satpata says verily in the beginning this universe was the brahman it creates the gods and having created the gods it made them ascend these worlds agni this world vayu the air and surya the sky then the brahman itself went up to the sphere beyond having gone up to the sphere beyond it considered how can i descend again into these worlds it then descended again by means of these two form and name whatever has a name that is name and that again which has no name and which one knows by its form this is form that is form as far as there are form and name so far indeed extends this universe these indeed are the two great forces of brahman and verily he who knows these two great forces of brahman becomes himself a great force in another place brahman is said to be the ultimate thing in the universe and is identified with prajapati purusha and prana in another place brahman is described as being the sava savaya savayambhu self born performing austerities who offered his own self in the creatures and the creatures in his own self and thus compassed supremacy sovereignty and lordship over all creatures the conception of the supreme man purusha in the rigveda also supposes that the supreme man pervades the world with only a fourth part of himself whereas the remaining three parts transcend to a region beyond he is at once present past and future sacrifice the first rudiments of the law of karma the law of karma is also one of the important themes in the play it will however be wrong to suppose that these monotheistic tendencies were gradually supplanting the polytheistic sacrifices on the other hand the complication of ritualism were gradually growing in the elaborate details the direct result of this growth contributed however to relegate the gods to a relatively unimportant position and to raise the dignity of the magical characteristics of the sacrifice as an institution which would give the desired fruits of themselves the offerings at a, at a sacrifice were not dedicated by dictated by devotion with which we are familiar under christian or vaishnava influence the sacrifice taken as a whole is conceived as hog notes to be a kind of machinery in which every piece must tally with the other the slightest discrepancy in the performance of even a minute ritualistic detail say in the pouring of the melted butter on the fire 
or the proper placing of utensils employed in the sacrifice or even the misplacing of a mere straw contrary to the injunctions was in was sufficient to spoil the whole sacrifice with whatsoever unnecessness it might be performed even if a word was mispronounced the most dreadful results might follow thus when pastor performed a sacrifice for the production of a demon who would be able to kill his enemy indra owing to the mistaken accent of a single word the object was reversed and the demon produced was killed by indra but if the sacrifice could be duly performed down to the minutest detail there was no power which would arrest or delay the fruition of the project thus the objects of a sacrifice were fulfilled not by the grace of the gods but as a natural result of the sacrifice the performance of the rituals invariably produce certain mystic or magical results by virtue of which the object desired by the sacrificer was fulfilled in due course like the fulfillment of natural law in the physical world the sacrifice was believed to have existed from from eternity like the vedas the creation of the world itself was even regarded as the fruit of a sacrifice performed by the supreme being it exists as hog says as an invisible thing at all times and is like the latent power of electricity in an electrifying machine requiring only the operation of a suitable apparatus in order to be elicited the sacrifice is not offered to a god with a view to propitiate him or to obtain from him welfare on earth or bliss in heaven these rewards are directly produced by the sacrifice itself through the correct performance of complicated and interconnected ceremonies which constitute the sacrifice Though in each sacrifice certain gods were invoked and received the offerings, the gods themselves were but instruments in bringing about the sacrifice, or in completing the course of mystical ceremonies composing it. Sacrifice is thus regarded as possessing a mystical potency superior even to the gods, who it is sometimes stated attained to their divine rank by means of sacrifice. Sacrifice was regarded. as almost the only kind of duty and it was also called karma or kriya or action and the unalterable law was that these mystical ceremonies for good or for bad moral or immoral for there were many kinds of sacrifices which were performed for injuring one's enemies or gaining worldly prosperity or supremacy at the cost of others were destined to produce these effects it is well to note here that the first recognition of a cosmic order or law prevailing in nature under the guardianship of the highest gods is said to be found in the use of word ratha literally literally the course of things this word was used as macdonell observes to denote the order in the moral world as truth and right and in the religious world as sacrifice or right and its unalterable law of producing effects it is interesting to note in this connection that it is here that we find the first germs of the law of karma which exercises such a dominating control over indian thought up to present day thus we find the simple faith and devotion of the vedic hymns on one hand being supplanted by the growth of a complex system of sacrificial rites and on the other bending their course towards a monotheistic or philosophic knowledge of the ultimate reality of the universe cosmogony mythological and philosophical the cosmogony of the rigveda may be looked at from two aspects the mythological and the philosophical the mythological aspect has it has in general two currents as professor macdonell says the one regards the universe as the result of mechanical production the work of carpenters and joiners skill the other represents it as the result of natural generation thus in rigveda we find that the poet in one place says what was the wood and what was the, what was the tree out of which they built heaven and earth the answer given to this question in taititriya brahmana is brahman the wood and brahman the tree from which the heaven and earth were made heaven and earth are sometimes 
described as having been supported with posts they are also sometimes spoken of as universal parents and parentage is sometimes attributed to aditi and daksha under this philosophical aspect the semi pantheistic manhim attracts a no notice the supreme man as we have already noticed above is there said to be the whole universe whatever whatever has been and shall be he is the lord of immortality who has become diffused everywhere among things animate and inanimate and all beings came out of him from his navel came the atmosphere from his head arose the sky from his feet came the earth from his ears the four quarters again there are other hymns in which the sun is called the soul atman of all that is movable and all that is immovable there are also statements to the effect that being is one though it is called by many names by the sages the supreme being is sometimes extolled as the supreme lord of the world called the golden egg in some passages it is said brahmana's pati flew forth these birds like a blacksmith in the earliest age of gods the existent sprang from the non existent in the first age of gods the existent sprang from the non existent thereafter the region sprang thereafter from uttana pada the most remarkable and sublime hymn in which the first jumps of philosophical speculation with regard to the wonderful mystery of origins of the world are found in the 129th hymn of rigveda the earliest commentary on this is possibly a passage in the satpata brahmana which says that in the beginning this universe was as it were neither non existent nor existent in the beginning this universe was as it were existed and did not and did not exist there was then only that mind wherefore it has been declared by the rishi there was then neither the non existent nor the existent for mind was as it were neither existent nor nor existent this mind when created wished to become manifest more defined more substantial it sought after a self a body it practiced austerity it acquired consistency the doctrine of atman there seems to be a belief in the vedas that the soul could be separated from the body in states of swoon and that it could exist after death though we do not find there any trace of the doctrine of transmigration in a developed form in the satpata brahmana it is said that those who do not perform rites with correct knowledge are born again after death and suffer death again in a hymn of rigveda the soul manas of a man apparently unconscious is invited to come back to him from the trees herbs the sky the sun etc in many of the hymns there is also the belief in the existence of another world where the highest material joys are attained as a result of the performance of the sacrifices and also in a hell of darkness underneath where the evil doers are punished as would be seen in the last act of uh, shakuntala in the satpata brahmana we find that the dead pass between two fires which burn the evil doers but let the good go by it is also said that there that everyone is born again after death is weighed in a balance and receives reward or punishment according as his works are good or bad it is easy to see that scattered ideas like these with regard to the destiny of the soul of man according to sacrifices that he performs or other good or bad deeds form the first rudiments of the later doctrine of metam 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 psychosis the idea that man enjoys or suffers either in another world or by being born in this world according to his good or bad deeds is the first beginning of the moral idea though in the brahmanic days the good deeds were more often of the nature of sacrificial duties than ordinary good works these ideas of possibilities of a necessary connection of the enjoyments and sorrows of a man with his good and bad works when combined the motif of curse in shakuntala the ideas of possibility of a necessary connection of the enjoyments and sorrows of a man with his good and bad works when combined with the notion of an inviolable law 
or order which we have already seen was gradually growing with the conception of ratha and the unalterable law which produces the effects of sacrificial works led to the law of karma and the doctrine of transmigration the words which denote soul in the rig veda are manas atman and asu the word atman however which became famous in later indian thought is generally used to mean vital breath manas is regarded as the seat of thought and emotion and it seems to be regarded as macdonell says as dwelling in the heart coming to the shaiva and the shakti school the worship of shiva the worship of shiva and rudra goes back to the vedas in the yajur veda we have sahatru sahatrudriya the te, the taitritriya aranyaka tells us that the whole universe is the manifestation of rudra some of the upanishads the mahabharata and some Pur puranas glorify shiva or rudra the sacred literature of the shaivas is called shaiva gama shri kantha places it side by side with the vedas madhavacharya refers to the four school of shaivism nakulisha pashupata pashupata shaiva pratya bhijana and rasheshwara and rasheshwara shaiv uh, nak the four school of shaivism are nakulisha pashupata um shaiva and pratyabhijna and raseshwara besides these we find mention of two more sects kapalika and kalamukha in yamuna's agama pra pramanya shaivism of the shaiva type is further divided into veera shaivism or shakti vishita vish vishita dvita and shaiva siddhanta the former is also known, known as lingyata or shatshala we may select here shaiva siddhanta as the representative of the southern shaivism and pratya pibhijna or kashmira shaivism as the representative of the northern shaivism shaiva siddhanta recognizes 18 agamas from the 5th to the 9th centuries many great shaiva saints like sambandar apar and sundarar flourished in south india who whose hymns constitute a magnificently rich devotional literature the collection of these hymns is called tirumurai manikaka manikaka vagasagar has written his famous tiruvasagam lekandar the author of shiva jana bodham who belongs to the 13th century is regarded as the first systematic expounder of the siddhanta philosophy his disciple arul nandi Shivacharya is the author of the famous work Shiva Janana Siddhar Shri Kantha Brahma Sutra which is com commented upon by Appaya Dikshita in his Shiva Shivar Kaman Kama Kamani Dipika is the light of Shaivism in general though not strictly according to the Siddhanta philosophy Shaiva Siddhanta calls itself Shuddha Vita the name which vallabha school bears but whereas vallabha means by the word shuddha that which is free from the impurity of maya mayasam and by the word advaita the non dual brahman shaiva siddhanta takes the word shuddha in the sense of unqualified and the word advaita in the sense of dvaita devoid of duality which means that difference in role in existence but inseparable from identity in consciousness this means that though matter and soul are real yet they are not opposed to shiva but are inseparably united with him who is the supreme reality this suggests the influence of aparadhi ap, apratha ki siddhi of ramanuja but whereas ramanuja makes matter and souls only the attributes of god shaiva siddhanta agrees with madhava in giving them substantive existence shiva is the supreme reality and is called pati or the lord who possesses the eight attributes of self existence essential purity intuitive wisdom infinite intelligence freedom from all bonds infinite grace or love omnipotence and infinite bliss 
just as the potter is the first cause, his staff and wheel is the instrumental cause and clay is the material cause of a pot. Similarly, Shiva is the first cause, his Shakti is the instrumental cause and Maya is the material cause of the world. The relation of Shiva and Shakti is that of identity. I would repeat again, just as the potter is the first cause, his staff and wheel is the instrumental cause and clay is the material cause of the play of the pot. Similarly, Shiva is the first cause. His Shakti is the instrumental cause and Maya is the material cause of the world. The relation of Shiva and Shakti is that of identity, though it is the power of the Lord. This Shakti is conscious, unchanging and eternal energy and is known as Savarupa Shakti. Like the Suddha Sattva and the Prakriti of Ramanuja, Shaiva Siddhanta also believes in pure matter and defiled matter. The material cause of pure creation is called Mahamaya or Bindu or Vidya, which that of defiled creation is called Maya or Bindu is called Asuddha Bindu, Maya or Asuddha Bindu. Mahamaya and Maya both are the material power of the Lord and are called Parigraha Shakti, which is different from the Savarupa Shakti, which forms the essence of the Lord. The Lord is omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient and performs the five function of creation, preservation, destruction of the universe and obs obscuration and liberation of the soul. The individual souls are called Pashu for like cattle, they are bound by the rope of Avidya to this world. The soul is really an all pervading eternal and conscious agent and enjoyer. It is consciousness, the essence of which is the act of seeing. It is different from the gross and the subtle body and the sense organs, etc. The bound souls mistake themselves as finite and limited in will, thought and action and in liberation are restored to their original nature. The fetters which bind the souls are called Pasha and are threefold, Avidya, Karma and Maya. The fetters which bind the souls are called Pasha and they are threefold, Avidya, Karma and Maya. Avidya is one in which all beings and is, and is beginningless. It is called Anama, Ana, Anama, Anava Mala or the impurity which consists in the false notion of the soul to regard itself finite or atomic and confined to the body and limited in knowledge and power. It is the avidya because it makes the soul ignorant and its inherent glory and clay and of its inherent glory and greatness. It is anava because it makes the soul mistake itself as atomic and finite. It is the bondage and the beast karma is produced by the deeds of the soul and is subtle and unseen and is the cause of the union of the conscious with the unconscious. Maya is the material cause of this impure world. The souls are of three kinds according as they are tainted with one or two or three of these impurities. The highest souls are tainted with the anama, anava mala only, the next with the karma, karmana mala also and the last with all the three anava, karma mana and maya. They are called respectively vijana kala, para, paralaya kala and sakala. In order to obtain release, the soul has to get rid of these three impurities and for this God's grace is absolutely essential. The divine grace is there for us all without the asking for it. For the Lord's desire that all the souls should know him, it is only for us to avail of it or not. After the removal of the Pasha, the soul becomes one with Shiva. It becomes co perissive with him and shares his glory and greatness. It is not conscious of its individuality on account of the experience of bliss. Nekandar says that just as salt dissolves into water and becomes co-pervasive with it, similarly, the liberated soul merges in God and becomes co-pervasive with him. It attains the status of Shiva, though the five functions of creation, etc. are reserved for the later alone. The essential quality or Savarupa Palakasana of the soul is the identity itself with its object and become co-pervasive with it. Its essence is its co-pervasiveness with the infinite Shiva. 
Thus, the bound soul identifies itself with matter and the liberated soul with Shiva and realizes it's, its own pure nature. This is the this is about the Vedic and the Shiva school of thought. Now coming to Rasa. So according to B. Chandra, coming to point second in the slide, uh, coming to point C in the slide, he says that Kalidasa's art and taste is full of flavor or rasa. So what is this rasa? What do we mean by rasa? Uh, a rasa denotes an essential mental state and is the dominant emotional theme of a work of art or the primary feeling that is evoked in the person that views, reads or hears such a work. Although the concept of rasa is fundamental to many forms of Indian art, including dance, music, musical theatre, cinema and literature, the treatment, interpretation, usage and actual performance of a particular rasa differs greatly between different styles and schools of abhinya and a huge regional difference even within one style. Bharat Muni enunciated the eight rasa in the Natya Shastra an ancient work of dramatic theory. Written during the period between 200 BC and 200 AD, each rasa, according to Natya Shastra, has a presiding deity and a specific color. There are four pairs of rasa, for instance, Hasya arising out of Shingara, the aura of a frightened person in black, and the aura of an angry person in red. Bharat Muni establishes the following. Shringara Rasa, it is identified by love, attractiveness. Presiding deities are Vishnu, the color is light green, Hasyam or laughter, mirth, comedy. Presiding deity are Pramata, color is white, Rodram or also known as Fury. Presiding deity are Rudra, color is red, Karunayam, compassion, tragedy. Presiding deity is Yama, color is grey, Vibhitsam, also known as disgust or aversion, presiding deity Shiva, color blue, Bhayankam, also known as horror, terror, presiding deity Kala, color black, Viram, also known as heroic, presiding deity Indra, color yellowish, Adbutam, also known as wonder, amazement, presiding deity Brahma, color yellow. A rasa is, is the developed a rasa is a developed relishable state of a permanent mood which is called thai bhava. This development towards a relishable state results by the interplay on it of attendant emotional conditions which are called vebhavas, anubhavas and sanchari bhavas. Vebhavas means karana or cause. It is of two kinds. Alambana, the personal or human object, and substratum or and udipana, the excitants, the excitants. Anubhava, as the name signifies, means the ensuance or effects following the rise of in emotion. Sanchari bhavas are those cross feelings which are ancillary to permanent mood. In the Indian performing arts, a rasa is an emotion inspired in an audience by the performer. They are described by Bharat Muni in the Natya Shastra, an ancient work of dramatic theory. Rasas are created by bhavas, the gestures and facial expressions of the actors. Expressing rasa is in classical Indian dance form is referred to as rasa abhinya. The Natya Shastra carefully delineates the bhavas used to create each rasa. The theory of rasa still forms the aesthetic underpinning of all Indian classical dance and theatre, such as such as Bharatnatyam, Kathak, Kuchipudi, Odissi, Manipuri, Kudiyattam, Kathakali, and others. The expressions used in Kudiyattam and Kathakali are extremely exaggerated exaggerated the theatrical expressions. The opposite of this interpretation is Bala Saraswati school of subtle and understated Abhinaya of the Devadasi. There, there were serious public debates when Bala Saraswati condemned Rukmani Devi's 
puritanistic interpretation and application of Sringara Rasa. The Abhinya of the Melitur style of Abhinya remains extremely rich in variations of the emotions, while the Pandana Nular style expressions are more limited in scope. The Natya Shastra identifies eight Rasas with eight corresponding Bhavas. Rati or love, Hasya or mirth, Soka or sorrow, Krodha or anger, Utsaha or energy, Bhaya or terror, Jugupsa or disgust, Vismaya or astonishment. Rasa has been an important influence on the cinema of India. The Rasa method of performance is one of the fundamental features that differentiates Indian, Indian cinema from the Western world. In the Rasa method, empathetic emotions are conveyed by the performer and thus felt by the audience. We are done with the introduction to the author where we discussed uh, about the date of Kalidasa. Uh, along with the date of Kalidasa, we discussed the Devanagari and the Bengali recensions, uh, the difference between them uh, with examples. Um, the Vedic and the Shaiva school of thought that has influenced the play, Sakuntala, the play that we are reading right now, were also discussed. Uh, then we uh, discussed the Rasa. Uh, the eight types of rasa uh, and how uh, these rasas would are employed in the work of uh, Kalidasa and would be discussed in finer details uh, in the next session about the play. So we will begin, begin with the history of Indian drama. History of Indian drama acts as the most charming, most enigmatic and most appreciating part of the whole genre of drama in India, given its incredible, incredible reach and limit to perfection. Since ancient times, India is one of the single most countries that triumphantly can sing its own praise of an indigenous dramatic tradition still remaining impassive from any foreign influence. When Hindu plays first were acknowledged by the European living through Sir William jo Jones's translation of Shakuntala in 1789. It was vastly conceived then that Greek literature had got through into India thoroughly charming their playwrights on the way. However, that opinion is not an all prevailing concept in present time. A bunch of critics now come to an agreement of the fact that Hindu drama was neither a shallow appropriation nor a shameless replication, but the sole product of native genius. The dramatist Bhasa or Bharata, 13 of whose works have been presently regained and published, is traditionally considered to have been the founder and father in the history of Indian drama. There, however, exists substantial disarray with regard to the authorship of umpteen plays due to the fact that it was the habit to assign a literary work to the ruler and whose court or under whose benefaction the real author was bound to survive. History of Indian drama for the very first time diverge, divulges about a dozen plays being written in India, most likely within 400 and 900, which was heart-rending enough to excite the interest and appreciation of present-day students. Sometime during those 500 years had survived the two biggest playwrights in India, Kalidasa and Bhavabhuti, whose compositions were ascribed to the emperors Sudraka and Sri Harsha respectively. However, gaping differences of opinion exist with regards to the dates of these authors, especially of Kalidasa. Kalidasa's birth and survival, the most prolific period in the historical involvement of Indian drama, established that there lies a difference ranging from half a century before the birth of Christ to the, to the 11th century onwards. Professor Kuno in Das Edish drama published in year 1920 places Kalidasa at approximately 400. Bhavabhuti was a Brahmin by birth from South India and possibly belonged to the early 8th century. During the Bhavabhuti's heyday, he must have been hugely admired and respected for the people looked up to him as Srikantha or 
he in whose throat exists fortune the colonial period in the history of indian drama and its evolvement had brought in a radical and almost whirlwind phase phase for dramatists from the country quite understandably the best known drama to the british was shakuntala by kalidasa which was translated into english by sir william jones in 1789 The play was successful enough to etch upon an insightful impression upon such scholars such as Goat and created something like an almost literary sensation. The play Shakuntala is divided into 7 acts and the story is believed to have been borrowed from the first book of Mahabharata. Its hero Dushyanta was a much distinguished and illustrious king of ancient times. The action within the play almost travels in a two-way mind-blowing motion. in part within the territory of fantasy and in part amidst the supernatural the dialogue delivery is always witnessed to be exceedingly poetic and idealistic due to shakuntala's almost limitless imaginative insight gallant and majestic poetical rendition and emotional appeal kalidasa's play has been esteemed by people of every nation as one of the masterpieces of dramatic literature in india The Rise of the Moon of Knowledge is an allegorical and theological dramatic piece in 11th act within which non-figurative and non-objective quality qualities such as will reason and the stupidities and vices of man are brought back to life and made to stand in conflict against each other The much apparent parallelism between the play and the European ethic of the late middle ages is of considerable interest a insignificant factor included within the genre of history of indian drama a political composition named the signet of the minister written approximately in 800 and another called as the bending of the braid of hair are amongst the most admired and well liked products of plays in ancient india besides these the titles of more than 500 sanskrit dramas are acknowledged in present times and more than a dozen have already been translated into umpteen modern european languages from them and from respective other references much have been learned and ascertained concerning the technique and ideals of ancient indian dramatic history and stage indian drama and theater is one of the oldest art forms always regarded as the most formal just like in indian music and dance history of indian drama beginning from the ancient vedic age moves on to the classical theater traditions also influencing modern theater particularly the hindi marathi and bengali theaters down the line looking back towards the historical path the beginning of the ancient dramas can be very much witnessed and observed in the rigveda together with purava urvashi yama yami indra indrani sarma pani and ushas shuktas even the epics of ramayana mahabharata and arthashastras are instilled with specific technique of dramas sages valmiki and vyasas and panini also had shed decisive light on dramaturgy and patanjali had heartily contributed in his mahabhasya that there existed two dramas namely kamsa vadha and vali vadha actors not only served as dancers but also as musicians Vatsyayana author of Kama Sutra states in his legendary tre- treatise of love and art of love making that kings were of the habit to arrange for programs of acting though through actors in festivals and celebrations as such the origin of dramas found from the early vedic age are considered the most authentic and authoritative amongst all the later creations later by the mid ad 300s history of indian drama enunciates that play acting and penning in the sanskrit language had developed and flourished to a considerable extent which actually served as epic poems each play was recognized around 1 to the 9 rasas standing for the moods and sentiments the primary aim was to produce an emote harmony as such authors kept off from moods that would come to clashes dr divya bha and all these plays came to a jubilant closing in historical times in indian drama there mainly existed dramatists consisting of bhasa kalidasa bhavabhuti so on and so forth 
the plays were composed on the basis of the hindu epics and the puranas bharata is considered to be the founder of indian dramaturgy and he described indian drama as the fifth veda thus he is often acknowledged as the father of indian theatrical arts bharata's natya shastra appears to be the first attempt to devise and contrive the technique or rather art of drama in a systematic manner the natya shastra advises the reader about not only what is to be portrayed in a drama but also how the portrayal is to be executed natya shastra incredibly emotes a panoptic scope of everything dramatic it consists of minutely delayed detailed percepts from both playwrights and the actors the much renowned bharata describes 10 types of drama ranging from 1 to 10 acts in addition history of drama also states that he also had laid down principle for stage design makeup costume and the theory of rasas and bhavas acting directing and music in in, in each of the individual chapters History of Indian drama elaborates majestically about Bharata setting out a detailed theory of drama where he referred to the bhavas and the rasas such as love pity anger disgust heroism or terror and comedy that generally inspire the audience the plays were also necessary to and amalgamate various rasas but however was to be dominated by only one according to natya shastra all the modes of expression employed by an individual which include speech gestures movements and annotation was mandatory to be utilized the ultimate representation of these expressions was supposed to have diverse and dissimilar modes according to the predominance and emphasis on one mode or another history of indian drama with all its refinements complexities sophistication and sublimities had comprehended bharata muni who recognized four main modes speech and poetry dance and music actions and emotion for the success of drama production now that we were discussing how most of these drama are based on puranas or the stories from purana let us come down to shakuntala and uh, read the story from mahabharata that it is based upon so uh, shakuntala uh, the source for the play is mahabharata book 1 chapter 62 to 69 the bard vyasa tells this story to the monarch janmejaya descendant of bharata at the great sacrifice that the monarch was performing the original story uh, from which Ma, uh, the kalidasa shakuntala is inspired from the source the story uh, is as such Dushanta out on a great hunt arrived Dushanta out on a great hunt arrived at Kanava's hermitage deep in the forest by the river Malini to pay his respect to the revered sage there he met Shakuntala who was alone her father having gone out of the hermitage to gather fruit This is from Mahabharata book 1 chapter 62 to 69. She offered the king due hospitality and in response to this to his question about herself told him the story of her birth as she had heard it from her father's own lips. The apsara Menaka had abandoned her as soon as she was born and some birds taking pity on the newborn babe had protected and fed it until kanava found the child and brought it up as his own daughter the king enamored of shakuntala's uncommon beauty and grace wanted to marry her according to gandharva mode of marriage a recognized form of marriage based on love and mutual agreement shakuntala demurred asked him to wait for her father's return when my father returns o king he will himself give me give me to you but the infatuated dushanta wanted to marry her instantly and began persuading her that according to the law she had complete right over herself and did not need parental permission to dispose of herself shakuntala replied that if it was not against the law she would become his wife on one condition and that the son and that was 
that the son born to her would be the heir apparent and succeed him as king the king agreed and took her as his wife and then left for his capital promising to send her with the proper retinue accompanied by a de by detachment of his army kanava on his return to the hermitage soon after was pleased and felicitated shakuntala on her excellent choice of a husband but dusyanta apprehensive about how the sage kanava would react to his union contracted during his brief absence from the hermitage did not send for her a son was born blazing like fire years went by until kanava noticing the extraordinary strength and energy that the boy displayed advised shakuntala that it was time to take him to his father and get him his consecrated and to get him consecrated as the heir apparent and sent her with her son in the company of some hermits to the capital shakuntala arriving at dushyanta's palace had herself announced and having duly honored him presented her son to him here o king is the son resembling a god born of your strength now accept him and carry out the promise you made dushyanta although he remembered his promise and every detail of their meeting and marriage pretended to remember nothing in the cruelest and most insulting words asked her to take her boy and get out shakuntala shattered by dushyanta's treatment of her stood dumbfounded but being a girl of great spirit and courage decided to fight for her son's right even though she could have destroyed him by the power of her penance she remained calm and explained the law to him and laid out with his duties and obligations were under the law to her and his son seeing that all her arguments were of no avail she flung these last words at him that she would not have anything to do with a man like him but that in the end her son would be sovereign and prepared to leave at that point an aerial voice spoke terrifying testifying to the truth of shakuntala's words and demanded that the king keep his promise to her the nobles ministers and priests at the court heard the aerial voice and accepted its testimony relief dushyanta welcomed her with costly gifts and received her and his son with honor making shakuntala queen and consecrating the boy as heir apparent the story ends with dushyanta explaining to shakuntala as to why he had acted as did the marriage having been a secret one unwitnessed his ministers and people would have doubted the legality of marriage and the legitimacy of the prince i forgive you all the unpleasant words you spoke to me my beloved because i love you he says welcoming her and accepting his son as the heir so this is the story in mahabharata but in the play we see uh, that it is the loss of the ring Uh, that uh, is the catalytic uh, is the catalyst uh, is the movement uh, which changes the whole uh, which delineates the plot line of the play it begins with shakuntala and dushyanta meeting in act 1 uh, and uh, then separating and the lovers reuniting it is not just uh, this simple a story of lovers separating and uniting there is a lot that goes on to it Uh, so as a part of it we have already discussed the shraddha and the vedic school of thought we have discussed about the rasa uh, the shringara rasa has been employed uh, in uh, the work of kalidasa in uh, the play of kalidasa uh, we have discussed about the rasa um, more about the play uh, this is the second point that we are discussing right now the play shakuntala Uh, is a beautiful blend of romance and fairy tale with elements of comedy in the last section of satpata brahmana that are devoted wholly to the description of the rituals of the horse sacrifice uh, the idea of sacrifice we just read in the uh, while discussing the vedic philosophy uh, and what does it signify where the names of some of the kings who performed them are mentioned we came across this line in nadapit the apsara shakuntala conceived bharata This is the earliest literary reference to Shakuntala and her son who performed many horse sacrifices on the banks of the river Yamuna after he had conquered conquered the world thus fulfilling the prophecy of the mystic personage Maricha in the play Nadapit is glossed uh, in the play Nadapit is glossed by the commentator as Kanava's hermitage 
but the identification has obviously been made on the basis of shakuntala dushyanta story in mahabharata where however the name nadapit does not occur the original story of shakuntala referred to in the uh, in shakuntala is lost to us we only have a very long and early version of it is the epic it must be our guess then that nadapit was some place of enchantment a pool of apsaras perhaps where strange things could happen and mortals meet and fall in love with celestial nymphs with the very first line of the play we are transported to a world of enchantment a handsome young king out hunting is lured far far out into another world this another world is a green world and the inevitable happens the song of the actress has already lured the waiting audience into this world music is used skillfully to make this transition a point to note here is that the word used for the fleet deer that has drawn king dushyanta far away is saranga which is also the name of a raga or musical mode the raga saranga is defined as one that through the attractive arrangement of notes colors the minds of the hearer music projects the appropriate mood the play is located in the mystic past in the world where mortals still moved with gods the humans and divine intermingled in this world the gods were not distant but friends of heroes like dushyanta who participated with him, with them to keep other order in the universe by removing the action of the play into the world of the past distant in time a poetic and dramatic purpose is served it inhabits a realistic approach to the play it clearly marks the line that separates the fictive world of the play from our everyday world in the sanskrit text the two worlds atha and iti at the beginning and end of a play and close it as it were literally it would read as follows now begins the play entitled abhijana shakuntalam and thus ends the play etc the play world thus created contains another world the world of deep and dark forest near the river malini the green world into which we are lured by the deer and where we meet shakuntala the child of nature who as noted earlier on is also envisaged as the guardian deity of the woodland as already noted apsaras born of the waters that is the creative waters where life originated are parts of nature associated with fertility and plentitude or yaksha yakshis are as yaksha yakshis are in the ancient myth of the churning of the ocean by gods and anti gods asuras to obtain ambrosia the cup of immortality or amrita the apsaras rose out of water together with many other wondrous things including blue, beauty that is shri herself in the vedic myth referred to shakuntala is an apsara and the daughter of an apsara in the epic tale which is the immediate source of the play this is an aspect of her origin that is important to keep in mind because in the play she is seen as the lady of nature one who glimpses in the green world into whom has flowed the beauty born of murmuring sound possesses the beauty of nature as well as its holiness in her nature and nurturer blend without being opposite to each other for her green world is also an ashrama a hermitage a tapovana or penance grove where tranquility prevails ordered by discipline she is an ornament of the hermitage as well as a creature of woodlands both phrases are the kings's not only are number of flower images other than the conventional one of the lotus petal eye and slender vine like arms used to describe her she is also seen as a flower the jasmine she and the jasmine are constantly brought together like the beloved in meghadutam they are sisters born of the same mother nature can this flower the sensitive plant survive in the other world the glit- we are talking about shakuntala here uh, the glittering gilded world of porava monarch it cannot it seems shakuntala herself poses this question rent from my dear father's is lap like the sapling of a sandal tree uprooted from the side of the malaya mountain how can i survive ever in an alien soil this image of the sandal tree will reoccur in a later very significant context in act 7 to which we shall refer presently act 5 is clear proof that she is trampled on stripped and mutilated and is at the point of death when she is wrapped from the astonished gaze 
of the beholders by a shaft of light. In this connection, it is very important to note two facts made clear in the play. Firstly, Shakuntala, never seen as actually living in the gilded world of the court and being a part of it. The fact is only talked about in various ways by different people at different times, but it is not part of the play. She is never brought into direct contact with the queen or the queen mother or any other ladies of Dushanta's place as the heroine, as other heroines in the work of Kalidasa. Secondly, the benediction is not spoken in this play in the world of the court, in the king's world. It is spoken in a world beyond this, which is the perfected world of the primal parents, Maricha and Aditi. There is a talk certainly of a return to this world, but the play comes to its end in Maricha's hermitage or Hemakuta, which mortals cannot reach in Act 7. Before the king can enter this world, he has to be purified, where he proves his worth by battling the forces of darkness and disorder that threaten the order of the universe. For this, he has to be roused from the state of utter despondency into which he had fallen. Weighed down by an overwhelming sense of guilt, he had become disoriented, nerveless and swooned away. It is significant that it is deep concern for someone close to him, like Madhavya, that pulls him out of this depression, lacking the will to live. Dushyanta's path to Maricha's hermitage and the finding of what has been lost is essentially similar to that of Yaksha's in the poem, though they are framed differently because of the differences in the two literary modes, drama and lyrics. The images of sanctity and purification are repeated. Vishnu's triple stride, Ganga's celestial stream, the sacred pool of golden lotuses. The whole Act 7, the whole of Act 7 is placed in the world of Maricha's hermitage, where the highest penances were wrought in the penance groves of the perfected seers. It is a world which ascetics perform the severest austerities to attain. Here, Maricha, born of the self-existent light, Himself performs penance with his consort Aditi. The last stage direction that brings the play to a close is no distinction is made between the characters belonging to the hermitage and the mortals who have to descend to Dushanta's capital. Another significant point to note in the last stanza of Shakuntala is the tone and quality of the final words of the poet and dramatist. May the self-existent Lord, who unites in himself the dark and the light, whose infinite power pervades the universe and highlight forever the round of my birth. The two world of the play, the green world of the woods and the gilded world of the royal court are too far apart and the reconciliation, reunion and restoration cannot be celebrated in either of them. The movement of epiphany has to happen elsewhere in another world. The two, the two worlds of Acts 1 and 7 reflect each other in many respects. The world of Act 1 is the world of nature with flowers blossoming, honeybees hovering over them of green foliage and tender young shoots and buds being prized open of clear waters flowing in channels to lave the roots of trees and the fresh cool spray of Malini's snow-fed waters wafted by the breeze. The color words presented in the description are those of fresh colors of the woodlands and of budding youth. In Act 7, on the other hand, the woodland, the color words are drawn mostly by the world of gold and gems and jewels. The golden sheen of the water, the glitter of raindrops, the gleam of flickering lightning and the liquid gold of the mountain itself reflecting the red and the gold of sunset. Here, the lotuses are golden as in Alaka, the places of meditation are not green meadows where deer roam or the roots of trees under the green shade of leafy trees, but jewel caves with celestial nymphs, gorgeously dressed and jewel and seductively walking around. The interest in this act is focused on the little prince, the future Bharata. Shakuntala is recognized by virtue of the token of love and not by love itself. Uh, the imagery of Act 1 and 3 convey this quite clearly. He is the bee circling at the daybreak over the jasmine cup. The play examines accepted ideals and the relation of what seems to what is, of semblance to truth through the comments of Madhvaya and 
by means of ironies built into structures and languages of the play. We will be discussing more about the play and the complexities of it in the next session in detail with pro, uh, with better slides on it. Uh, for today's session, we have discussed about the play and about the author. I'll be uh, sharing the material with you. Uh, there is a girl from your class, um, Vidushi, who has made a WhatsApp group for semester one. Uh, all the study material is going to be shared with you in the WhatsApp group. So please contact Vidushi for that. Thank you. Thank you.